All right, everyone. Welcome back to the 2022 NATO Youth Summit, Securing Our Shared Future. I am your host, Lauren Speranza from SIPA. Uh, we have had a fantastic program so far, but I would venture to say that we're heading into my favorite part, where we're going to hear from even more youth voices than we already have. And to kick us off, we're going to start with someone who is the best advocate for the next generation of allied leaders. She is the original hashtag NATO nerd, if you can believe it. And uh, you may know her as the US ambassador to NATO, the Honorable Julianne Smith, who is going to share a special message with all of us. Let me start by congratulating SIPA and the NATO Public Diplomacy Division for organizing this second youth summit. This is such an important gathering, and I regret that I can't join you in person today. I'd much rather be with all of you there in the actual venue, but sadly, by the time this summit takes place, I'll actually be out of town. But I did want to say a few words about how important this particular gathering is, especially right now. I think it's absolutely critical that NATO finds ways to engage younger people about the importance of this alliance and to answer their questions uh, about what NATO does and why it's still important today. We've looked at recent polls and we've discovered some troubling things about the younger generation. We're discovering that those between the ages of 18 and 35 actually seem to have less interest in national security more broadly. They seem to be perhaps less informed about the NATO alliance, less attached to its history, which is understandable. And we've also seen in some other polls that the younger generation isn't that interested in the nitty gritty details of US national security and foreign policy. But here's what we do know. We know that the next generation, that the people represented at this particular summit care deeply about issues like climate change, that they care deeply about human rights, that they care deeply about global poverty. And the important thing is that all of those issues actually tie to the security issues that we tackle each and every day here at NATO headquarters. NATO was created many, many decades ago in the face of the end of World War II, and the emphasis then was on security. Security so that the economies in Europe and in North America could prosper. And NATO's been very successful in providing and ensuring that security. And as a result, we've seen what can come when democratic allies join forces to tackle common challenges. So after all of the progress that the Alliance has made over 70 plus years, the Alliance is now focused on new challenges. First and foremost, we're coming together in this moment to work with other democratic allies to provide Ukraine with the support that it needs in this moment. And we're also coming together as a transatlantic family to apply unprecedented levels of pressure on Moscow to get them to stop this unprovoked, unmitigated war. And we're turning our attention to future challenges here at the NATO Alliance. We're looking at challenges like cybersecurity, emerging and disruptive technologies. We're looking at space as a new domain. And we're also looking at climate change, because climate change is a national security concern. When we see regional conflicts and instability, we can take a closer look and often find that climate change can lead to these types of regional conflicts and breed instability. And for that reason, here at NATO headquarters, we are taking on climate change as a national security issue. So NATO is evolving and changing all the time, but we can't do it without the people in this room at this event right now. We need you to be engaged in this alliance. We need need you to care about the values that we're
we're protecting. We need you because you bring the innovation, you bring the know-how in tackling things like climate change or global poverty or addressing human rights concerns. You also bring exposure and ideas to technology in ways that my generation never will. So thank you for taking the time to join this summit right now in this moment. Thank you for asking the hard questions and thank you for your interest in what NATO does. And I hope that at some point in the near future, we can actually have this conversation in person. So again, I salute I salute the efforts of, of those at SEPA. I salute my colleagues in the NATO Public Diplomacy Division and wish you a, a wonderful couple days at NATO headquarters. So wonderful to hear from Ambassador Smith. And after that very fitting intro, we are going to move into our next session, which is our policy pitching competition. We get to hear from all of you. So SIPA and NATO, in the run-up to the summit, ran a policy pitching competition that basically asked contestants to pick a policy challenge that they thought NATO ought to be paying more attention to. They had to articulate that challenge and then make a concrete policy recommendation or an action that NATO needs to take to address it. We had more than 100 entries, uh, more than 40 different countries represented, and we had a panel of experts choose the top three based on their originality and their feasibility and also the explanation of the subject matter. So we'll now have an opportunity to hear each of our top winners pitch their ideas, and then we have an excellent panel of experts who will help us unpack some of the ideas that they raised and react to their pitches. So over to our winners. Good evening to everyone attending in person in Brussels. My name is Katarina Kiritisova. I'm a policy fellow at the European Leadership Network and a Wilson Center Global Fellow. I was happy to learn that my pitch was selected and very much look forward to your feedback. At the Brussels Summit last year, members of the Alliance agreed to work towards reducing their military missions. The outbreak of the war, additional defense spending, and the provision of fuel, weapons, and ammunition to Ukraine, all of which are necessary, might affect NATO's military missions reduction plans. Yet, the very same week that Russian tanks started rolling into Ukraine, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its latest report, which gave the bleakest warning yet of the climate change impacts and the time we have left to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. So despite the war, climate change is not going to go away. With fuel supply infrastructure being attacked in Ukraine, the war has also shown that dependence on fossil fuels is a big vulnerability for our militaries. So moving away from fossil fuels makes sense, not just from a climate point of view, but also for our military survivability. NATO needs to step up its efforts in this regard. How? It could shift away from single fuel policy towards more sustainable alternatives. It could develop green minimum capability requirements for each ally to meet. It can update existing policies and standardization agreements, and also rethink what counts as a defense contribution. As allies invest more in defense, and before the contracts have been written, we need to think carefully about what capabilities we need, and make sure that these additional budgets are also used for innovation and development of green equipment. In Madrid, there should be a clear political signals that we are going back to collective defense, but we are also going to stay the course, stick to our ambition to reduce military emissions, and keep our focus on the effects of climate change, which will make future conflicts more likely. Thank you. My name is Rezan Folcha, and I'm a student at the Babish Boy University of Cluj-Napoca, Romania. I'm working as an advisor to a member of the Romanian parliament, and I'm a former UN Youth Delegate of Romania. My policy proposal focuses on the vital need to involve youth, a generation of resilience in decision-making processes on security and resilience issues. In this sense, NATO can implement some of the following directions. Appointing NATO youth delegates for the member states, creating the role of a NATO youth envoy, uh, hubs for youth ideas, financing youth-led projects dedicated to uh, shaping solutions for massive challenges, creating a scholarship for young people wanting to implement projects inside of NATO in order to empower the organization, 
uh, permanent consultative bodies for young people and constant youth resolutions and policies. Young people have proven to be an invaluable resource in addressing and facing uh, the massive challenges that we're uh, tackling right now in the present. NATO has a strong role in empowering them to be become actual stakeholders in all of these processes. Why don't we give them a chance to participate and to involve? Thank you so much. My name is Maria Luisa. I've just completed an advanced diplomacy program in Lisbon and my policy challenge pertains to WPS partnerships for NATO. As seen in Ukraine, the prevalence of women's rights violations plays a role in gender equality progress and the diffusion of WPS principles. Given that NATO is bound to Resolution 1325, the Alliance should expand its regional cooperation mechanisms to address a wider spectrum of gender inequalities, thus ensuring that WPS principles are fully implemented in the next decade. To do so, in the new strategic concept, the WPS agenda must be a cross-cutting uh, strategic pillar, and NATO should rethink its institutional partnerships with the EU and the UN, for instance, but also with civil society through a new formal and resourceful WPS task force. This multilateral approach could benefit NATO through the development of a common language on WPS that reflects women's experiences and needs. It could promote exchanges on gender expertise, monitoring, transparency, accountability and funding tools. And it could allow NATO to look inwards and develop a broader and inclusive approach to WPS. Terrific. Congratulations to our winners, and thanks very much to all of them for sharing their ideas. Now we have a fantastic panel of experts to help us react to those ideas. Uh, are they good ideas? Are they realistic ideas? Uh, are they original ideas? Um, so first I will introduce uh, our panel, and then we'll go through and hear more. So we have the privilege of having with us Max Brooks, who is one of the foremost thinking minds on future challenges, future security challenges. He's the author of World War Z, uh, among many other things. Max, it's so great to have you with us. We also have Dr. Elizabeth Bra, who is the author of her latest book, God's Spies and the Defender's Dilemma, also one of the most creative thinking uh, minds in Washington and trying to propose uh, innovative solutions to today's challenges. On stage here, I am joined by Dr. Benedetta Berti Alberti, who is the head of policy planning in the office of the Secretary General here at NATO. And I also have Tanya Latic, who is Policy Officer for Security and Defense Policy at the European External Action Service. So thank you all so much. We have a really diverse group of voices here, different perspectives. So we had our three pitches, one on reducing NATO's military emissions, one on creating some kind of youth envoy to have more dedicated youth engagement at NATO, and the third on kind of institutionalizing the women, peace, and security agenda at NATO. So I'd like to start with just a lightning round from all four of you, like one to two minutes each, the top points from each of those. You can react to all three of them. You know, what did you like? What did you not like? What would never ever happen in a million years? Um, and I'd love to hear from all of you. Max, let's start with you. All right, <clears throat> let's start with the, the first idea about uh, climate change and fossil fuels. And this has been a huge issue for the United States military going back to Iraq and Afghanistan. So I would encourage the author of this to look up Thomas L. Friedman's book, uh, where he talks about the Green Hawks. This is a unit within the United States military trying to get us off fossil fuels because it not only makes us dependent, it, straight, it weakens our supply lines, it stretches them and makes us more vulnerable to attack. So there already are allies waiting for these kinds of ideas. And I would encourage this author to find these allies within all existing militaries uh, because no general wants to be dependent on fossil fuels. And there could be a great alliance between the environmental movement and a smarter military. Right. As far as uh, a NATO scholarship, the second idea, great idea because scholarships are so important because they groom new talent for the future as far as long-term commitment. And the last one, the last idea about women's rights 
hits on the very core of the great struggle that is going to affect all of us. We'll be dead and gone, but the next generation will be grandchildren before this struggle is over. Democracy versus autocracy. We are in a struggle for human rights. In the West, in the Western democracies, it is all about having the right to exist as who you are versus these countries we are up against where you do not get to exist. And so there cannot be anything more important than a struggle for human rights and most importantly for values. If nothing else defines this great struggle of the next half century to a century, it will be a struggle for values. So well done. <laughs> Such an important point. Values has been one of our through lines today. Max, thank you so much for that. Okay, uh, Elizabeth Bra, I would love to come to you next. Uh, you've been thinking about how to think creatively on these issues. What did you think? I loved all three ideas. So let me start with uh, the first one about uh, fossil fuels. So that's, it, it's something that, that uh, the US armed forces, UK armed forces and, and others uh, are already thinking about. And why are they thinking about this? Because as, uh, as Max said, it's uh, the, the use of fossil fuels by our armed forces makes us uh, vulnerable. Um, and uh, I must say, uh, in addition to that, I think this, this war in Ukraine is demonstrating uh, so powerfully and, and quite painfully um, why it matters that the armed forces use fossil fuels because we, every time uh, 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 an oil depot is bombed that's that's uh, or struck by a missile that's a lot of co2 emissions going up in in, in the air uh, and uh, exacerbating our problem it's it's painful our, our, our climate change problem it's painful to watch every single time of course we want the ukrainians to win we want them to all be able to bomb as many russian oil depots as possible but nevertheless it's uh, co2 emissions uh, exacerbated every single time. So it's a fantastic uh, idea. I would encourage you to look at within your proposal how uh, armed forces and governments can work with industry uh, because without that cooperation, nothing much will happen, uh, which is why the, the progress has been so slow uh, to date. And, and also maybe look at what DARPA can do uh, to, to speed the process along by funding uh, innovative projects. Then the second idea, uh, NATO has obviously been concerned uh, for a long time about uh, how to work with, with youth and, and this, uh, this, this very event that, that we are at at the moment is, is, a, is a part of that effort to, to uh, reach more young people. So uh, I would encourage you to, to find a formalized process by which your youth assembly, which I, is an idea that I think is, is fantastic, how would that assembly feed into uh, feed it, uh, its ideas into NATO. So how do we make sure that it's not just an assembly that meets and then uh, and, and come up, comes up with lovely ideas and then everybody uh, goes home and that's it. There has to be some sort of dissemination of the ideas into uh, NATO, um, NATO HQ, NATO, uh, NATO parliaments, NATO government. Uh, how would that work? And, and also how would these people be selected? We have to make sure that it's not just uh, a, a forum for, for uh, the NATO nerds out there, but for many others. Um, uh, and the third idea, uh, yes, nobody would be opposed to, to, um, to anything you propose, but again, what is the, the implementation? I think that's, that's uh, where the, the challenge is. It, 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 it stands in a long line of fantastic proposals, um, but uh, how, how, would, how would this, well, how, how would it go from from uh, being a, a sort of a, 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 a policy idea to to being uh, enacted by by the people uh, who are supposed to to uh, implement it? So yeah. uh, I guess the, the, the question for that, me there is, is more of a technical one. No, it's a really important point because I think implementation is always the hardest part. I think there's a lot of good ideas out there, but trying to get them into practice uh, is sometimes the hardest part. Um, now for another sobering perspective, I'm sure uh, our two representatives here who have their finger on the pulse inside NATO as well as the EU can offer some perspectives uh, about what they think. Benedetta, can we start with you? Sure, of course. And uh, I would start by saying that one of the things I like about this uh, three proposals is that they focus on three topics where that are priorities to NATO. These are all areas where NATO is working. There's uh, on climate change, we have a strategy, we have an action plan, and I'm sure we'll talk about it 
a little bit more in the rest of the conversation. So now just to focus on the conceptual framework of yeah. the idea, which I really liked, I think it's great that Katarina started from uh, highlighting this false dichotomy that sometimes we hear, whether it's yeah. Uh, you do more to increase your defense, you're going to have to relinquish other ambitions. So it's either climate, climate actions versus defense. And that's not really the way, the way we see it. I think that's a false dichotomy we really have to, uh, to question. There, especially when it comes to sustainable defenses, energy efficiency, there is a win-win space here. And it's a space in which we increase our operational effectiveness, we become more technologically advanced, more competitive, and at the same time, more environmentally friendly. And at the same time, we reduce our carbon footprint. So I think it's right, uh, it's right on the money to focus on minimizing energy dependency. That's also something NATO has been working on for, for many years. And I'm sure we'll have more time to return to the details of the proposals. But I do like that it combines two areas that are incredibly important to us as an alliance. Uh, I think the very same logic can be applied to our second proposals. Uh, this is one of the challenges challenges, I think, not just for NATO, but for each organization, but especially here. What we're doing here and now, we're deciding matters related to security and defense that affect everyone's lives. And sometimes the decision we're taking today will have the greatest impact on those that are in no position to influence them. Right. So there is this, uh, I think, more responsibility to, to an extent to be sure that those are that are impacted, the future generations have a, an opportunity to express and to make their voice heard. And this is what today is all about. And it's also what we've been trying to do very actively at NATO. And just last year, we conducted this NATO 2030 process. And, it was, and that's how this NATO Youth Summit was born. And as part of that, we also, uh, the Secretary General was very keen to have youth uh, involved in providing recommendations, and it's actually great to have Tanya here because she's one of the young leaders we selected last year for this process, and uh, and and they provided fantastic uh, recommendation that really helped advance the into 2030. So yeah, spot on. And then on the integrating human peace and women peace and security into everything NATO does, I think that's that's absolutely the way we think about it. Uh, I will avoid the bureaucratic jargon of <laughs> saying we have to mainstream, but in reality, that's what we have to do. It has to become a reflex, not an add-on, but something that we consider from the get-go in developing policies and implementing them. And I would also say, and I'll stop here, that we are very much trying to do that, and we are also trying to do that when it comes to climate change considerations and human security at large. These are all issues that we need to integrate into our policy approach. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Tanya, over to you. My reaction to all of them is yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, uh, honestly, to Katarina's proposal, I think, touching a bit on what Elizabeth said, I think there's an implicit question there. Are we able to walk and chew gum at the same time? Mm -hmm. Are we able to provide defense and deterrence while accelerating uh, our climate commitments? Yeah. And I think just this week, we have seen how um, our strategic dependencies are being weaponized. So I think there is an argument for why, yes, we have to walk and chew gum at the same time. And I think probably everyone in this room has the expectation from their governments, as well as the in different international organizations that we all represent here to do precisely that. And on, well, Katarina already mentioned the um, rethinking what a defense contribution is. I mean, mm -hmm. you know me, you've read the report. Thank <laughs> you for referencing it. I'm, I've always tried to make an argument for how defense is much bigger than the 2%. It's not a very yeah. popular argument, but I still think it's valid. And I think particularly when we discuss climate, that's, it's very important to reassess what exactly counts as a contribution to our common defense. And I also think um, the, looking at EU-NATO cooperation and look, taking climate as a booster, if you will, for this topic, I think is, uh, is important because we do share uh, the same commitments here. And I think we all share the fact that, uh, or the ambition for, to accelerate them. Yeah. When it comes to um, Razvan's proposal, I think, again, we're not starting from scratch. I'm very glad that Benedetta already mentioned the NATO 2030 Young Leaders, and I also want to emphasize how diverse it was and how, you know, as Elizabeth, I think, said, it wasn't just NATO nerds. Yeah. It wasn't. So I think that diversity really added to, to the report very, very much. And I really like the idea of, um, of the youth assembly, and I think it sounds a bit like a youth wing of the NATO <laughs> PA. I mean, why not? So definitely, yes, NATO, do, uh, do take note. Um, on Maria Luisa, 
Yes, again, of course, a very, very big uh, yes. I think th this idea, when I read your pitch of a transatlantic women, peace, and security uh, task force or assembly, I think that that's very good because I do think advancing on the women, peace, and security agenda is a direct deliverable of the transatlantic relationship, broadly speaking, whether it's EU NATO or EU US, I think that's a deliverable yeah. uh, concretely uh, un under that. So, yeah. And shout Great. out to Maria Luisa for mentioning the strategic uh, compass in her pitch. <laughs> Yes, fantastic. Okay, thank you all so much. I want to come back to some of the details of these proposals and how we might make them happen in a second. But Max, I actually wanted to come back to you to zoom out for a second because you and I have had some conversations before uh, about kind of the need for good ideas and you've kind of yourself in your own work served as a bridge between the world of Hollywood and the creative community and the defense community and trying to uh, facilitate the exchange of new perspectives and new ways of thinking about things. Um, you know, some of your forward thinking in your novels and some of those things have helped inform how the military and institutions like NATO plan for future threats because it just offers a different perspective. And I think that's one of the challenges when it comes to, you know, taking Making pitches like this and trying to put them into uh, the real debates that are happening inside an organization. So could you just reflect on that for a little bit about the need for those ideas and how you get them in the conversation? Yeah, yeah uh, you know, I've always found that in the creative process, the problem is not finding good ideas. The ideas are there. The, the, the challenge is running those ideas past the department of no. And every organization has a department of no. And in that department of no, there are sub-departments. There's the department of fear, department of greed, department of arrogance, department of tribe. And they're, they're all different depending on which department you're up against. So the challenge when you have a good idea is identifying your specific department of no. And then you have to find the most important person on your team, which is a champion. Someone with the right skill set that can get your idea past that department of no. Like, let's go specifically to fossil fuel. All right. I can tell you the department of no is going to be a general or an admiral that's going to say, wait a minute, lives are at stake here. So I'm not going to sacrifice an ounce of combat performance in order to save the environment. I'm just not going to do that. So then you say, okay, I know a way around that. Don't focus on combat performance focused on logistics and support because the majority of all militaries is not combat units, it's support units. It's the trucks that get things from one place to another. It's the helicopters, it's the support aircraft that transport everything. Those can all be electrified and you wouldn't have to sacrifice anything. Uh, and then you would reduce the majority of fossil fuel dependence of military. So that's one example of getting past the department of no, leave the fighter planes, leave the tanks, let them burn whatever CO2 they have to. But when it comes to the logistics, let's focus on electrification. Interesting, thank you so much. Okay, I wanna encourage everyone just to keep their answers brief because I know we're already uh, on the clock here and I wanna give some opportunities for some of our audience here to chime in. Um, so maybe we could get a mic if it's possible from the production team here. Um, okay, super. So let me come back uh, to this idea of, uh, we talked a little bit about the climate proposal already. So I want to come back to this idea of uh, the youth uh, envoy and the idea of creating member delegates or some kind of youth assembly. Now, there's actually a lot of youth organizations. Some of them are sitting here in this room, YATA, Atlantic Forum, some others. Um, how could this idea be, uh, maybe solve a challenge that those organizations don't already tackle, or could it be complementary to that? Um, maybe, uh, Benedetta, you could just give a, a few seconds of response on that. Sure. Uh Happily, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still representative of those organizations in the audience, so it's, I'm very tempted to actually turn to them and say, how can we help yes, you? I know, that's why I want to Because they get are the doing fantastic work already. So I think that it's definitely not about creating new structure just for the sake, but it's, I think it would be working through the organizations that we have, uh, more funding, more resources, more uh, political uh, attention. There's a lot that we can do within, uh, within what we 
have, but I think that the, 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 the importance of the proposal is to put the emphasis on the fact that when we're making important policy decisions, we have to make sure we are representative of our society, and that means being diverse, being inclusive, and including youth. Then we'll find different forms to do it. But I think that's really the winning uh, proposition here. Yeah, I think that's very important. And sometimes we have a tendency of trying to create separate uh, platforms for youth, you know, and we risk the kind of kids' table versus actually integrating <laughs> youth uh, <laughs> sitting shoulder to shoulder, you know, exactly. put them inside yes. uh, the, the organization. Hire young work. people. Exactly. <laughs> this, is why, this is why also at this forum, you know, we really tried to make an effort to have intergenerational panels, you know, young people sitting next to senior people and having that kind of dialogue. So um, such an important point. Um, Tanya, maybe as a, uh, I know you're offering the EU kind of perspective here, and uh, the Women, Peace, and Security agenda, I mean, not officially, sorry, not to put you on the spot, um, also need to but, uh, but the, the Women, Peace, and Security agenda, how much of this is kind of an EU set of issues versus a NATO set of issues, and who should actually be the one responsible for bringing that to life? Well, in general, I really try to advocate against using the versus there. Sure. It's an EU and NATO issue, I believe. And I think as international security providers, we both, both organizations have an equal responsibility. I mean, if we look at, I mentioned the strategic uh, compass, our latest EU security and defense strategy was just adopted. It has a very, very robust part on women, peace, and security, and how, not, how we don't only want to mainstream that when it comes to headquarters and in the EU institutions, but how we export that abroad in our own CSD what we call CSDP missions and operations. We have 18 of them. How we want to promote that even further and how we put that into practice, how we set higher standards in doing that. And again, I really think that as international security providers at home and abroad, the EU and NATO have a shared responsibility to do that and to do that together. Yeah, very important point. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Elizabeth, maybe I could come back to you on some of the climate issues because we have a question coming in here uh, from the app that is related to energy and environmental issues and kind of how energy has almost become a weapon of uh, hybrid warfare. And I know you've spent a lot of time thinking about this. I mean, we just see this in the headlines this morning, you know, Russia cutting off gas supplies to Bulgaria and Poland. Um, so as we think about what NATO is doing on uh, climate, you know, it's not just about reducing military emissions, although that's a really important point. It's also about countering uh, how resources are being used as a weapon. So what are some of your thoughts on how the Alliance uh, can counter those issues? Uh, yes, it is about how much uh, energy we use and, 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 and all sorts of finite resources. And so this is where actually where the energy proposal um, with the energy side meets the, the youth side. Uh, of, of, of your uh, winning uh, ideas here, because uh, I think actually if we were, uh, if we look at, if, if NATO uh, were to issue an open call to, to young people to, to uh, submit proposals, you would get a lot of proposals from people who have, from young people who have no experience with NATO, maybe not that much interest in national security, but who feel passionate about the environment and who, who would maybe feel, uh, feed completely unexpected ideas into your process uh, by, for example, being elected on, on the basis of such proposals, being elected to the, to the youth assembly that, that, uh, that was just proposed. So, so, um, so I think uh, it's, uh, this is where, this is where uh, we have a, a potential win-win. I'm not trying to suggest that the Greta will solve NATO's problems, but nevertheless, if I, that sort of mindset where, where we are set out to solve uh, climate change can also help NATO. And we should remember that it's not just about reducing, uh, uh, as you said, Lauren, about reducing the, the resources that our armed forces use. It's about reducing the finite resources that we all use. So, for example, it, it, uh, the, the people in the room and, and Max and I, would we be willing to, uh, to turn off uh, power, uh, energy, uh, internet for, for one hour a day to help reduce our country's dependence on, on fossil fuels? And uh, it's not just, as, as we see this week, it's not just a matter of an abstract consideration. We have all done Earth Hour. I hope we have all done Earth Hour and turned off uh, our lights for, for one hour a day every 23rd of, of April. But it's, it's, it's a practical problem if we keep 
once you make more energy, we will have more, and, and if we don't develop renewables, we will have this uh, incredible dependence on other countries, whether it's Russia, whether it's Saudi Arabia, whether it's another country. So, so maybe, um, well, I hope those two first ideas can be combined, and I think I, I'm willing to bet and, and, and come back next year and be proven right or possibly wrong, but I'm willing to bet that if you were to open an, uh, issue an open call to young people in, in different countries who are not involved in national security, just anybody to propose ideas for a youth assembly, you'd get uh, incredibly innovative ideas. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, I have about five minutes left. This session is flying, but I love it because we're having a really good back and forth. Um, I'm gonna try and squeeze one more question out of each of you if I can. Uh, so Max, let me come to you because uh, in thinking about how to implement these ideas, how much do you think uh, depends on public opinion? You know, sometimes it's not just the matter of the will of a leader to implement some of these good ideas that their staff or whoever might be proposing, uh, but they are beholden to elections, to public opinion, to those types of things. So could you comment on that a little bit? Yes. Uh, one of the reasons that we won the Second World War was because in the West, we had two armies. We had the army that fights, and then we also had the army that communicates with the public, with the voter and the taxpayer. And we don't have that army anymore. We've seen this divorce for the last 50 years. It's been growing between the population and those who protect them. And now they're almost completely divorced. And we need to get back together. We need to have a new army of communicators, people who can take these big, crazy, broad, complicated ideas and break them down to the average voter, particularly the average young voter, and say, listen, this is why this matters to you. There used to be a whole newsreel in World War II called Why We Fight. We need to bring that back and rename it Why We Care. Hmm. Really important point. I think we'll talk a little bit more about that in our next session. Uh, but thanks so much, Max. Um, Tanya, maybe I can give you a spin of that question, which is, I think, another big part of how we implement these ideas is actually having leaders in multinational organizations agree on these types of things. And uh, right now, you know, I think in the past few weeks with the war in Ukraine, we've seen a remarkable amount of unity. But, uh, you know, so whether in the future, if we're going to implement some of these proposals on youth engagement or climate or uh, WPS agenda, you know, how long uh, can we keep up this unity? Is it just because we're in a crisis, so to say? Uh, how long can we keep it up? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, I, I, I was so impressed, like everyone, I think, to see how genuine and how easy in a way this unity came. I had the privilege of being in several ministerial meetings, also with the NATO Secretary General as it happens, and I was so, my mind was blown to see how everyone was on the same line. Yeah. And I think that this sets a very high standard for how unity should look like. It's this, it's right here, right now, this is how it looks like. And I think we also have to form a bit of a, a reflex to show ourselves that, look, it's possible. So I think it also probably surprised all allies and EU member states as well, like, look, wow, this is, it's amazing, we can do it. So I think this is the most important part, that we have shown to ourselves that we can do it, and that the lowest common denominator, actually, when, you know, we are all extremely united, can be very high, as a very, um, a person that I admire very much said once. That's yeah. fantastic. Um, Benedetta, if I could ask you, uh, if there were one of these proposals that we have heard, uh, is there one piece of them, because some of them had a couple of concrete ideas in there, but is there one piece of it that you could foresee potentially being incorporated into NATO's next strategic concept in the strategy? Aha. Very, very precise. Well, <laughs> I, I would say that in each of these proposals, there are elements that are actively part of NATO's work. For example, when we talk about climate change, uh, the focus on reducing uh, our energy, de our dependence on fossil fuels, the focus on diversifying energy supply, the focus on increasing sustainability and energy efficiency. Well, this is something that NATO has been working on for years uh, through investing in our, scientific in our scientists, by investing in green technology, by working with the private sector. So there are elements of that proposals that we can 
can accelerate and scale, but it builds on something that the organization has been doing. So in that sense, I think that, uh, that, that it's not far-fetched to see a reference to the importance of mitigate or contributing to the mitigation when it comes to climate change in, in our next uh, big strategic concept. But of course, I cannot, for, I cannot read the future, but I anticipate that will not be, uh, that will not be an incredibly big stretch. Just another, I'll stop because I know we don't have a lot of time, but I think another important point that has been raised throughout the last half an hour is this relationship between energy security, national security, climate change, and really the importance of looking at security through this broader lens and looking at our strategic vulnerabilities has something that we need to be a collectively evaluate assess and ultimately mitigate together as allies. And I think that's also something that we will, uh, we will see uh, in, the, in our strategic concept as we continue to boost our work on resilience. So I'll just stop there. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. I know we are out of time, uh, so I am really sorry to have to end our discussion here. But uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists for a really interesting back and forth and uh, for giving some feedback to our winners uh, who put forth some really good ideas. I'm encouraged after listening to that. So thank you all so much for uh, your feedback. 